You probably already know it by now, but I love Freedom Planet. Both games. And when you love the game, it's natural to explore every bit of it. Or you can take a different route and play the game with some challenge in mind. And it's exactly what we're doing today. Greetings everybody, I'm Lunatic Ludwig, and today we'll find out, is it possible to beat Freedom Planet while only rolling? For this challenge, I'll be playing as Carol the Wildcat. When you move and press down, she will curl into a ball like Sonic the Hedgehog, and in this stage she can deal damage to enemies and even break through certain walls. And this is the only attacking move I'm allowed to use, every other is banned. However, jumps, wall jumps, pet jumps and pounces are all allowed since they don't deal any damage. Usage of bugs and glitches is allowed, as long as it doesn't involve banned moves. As for the bike, I'll refrain from using it, because acceleration deals damage. If the game forces us on a bike, we'll immediately dismount if possible. However, I had to make one exception to the usage of the bike and I'll talk about it when I get there. Also, I won't count cutscenes as well as sections where we have completely different moveset. Check the Battle Blazer Shoot'em Up section for reference. This run was done on the last Steam release and on the hardest difficulty. Trust me, it will become very painful very quickly. And now, without further ado, let's get straight into the challenge. Dragon Valley is the first level of this challenge is very easy. Although because I play on hard difficulty, I take a lot more damage from regular attacks. Just look at this, I got shot by that turret enemy and it took away 2 battles of my health. Right now it's not that big of a deal, but some later levels will be throwing tons of enemies at me, draining my health even faster. Anyway, the first difficulty comes in the form of this gas can. Just kidding, but bear with me. If you touch a gas can while playing a scale, she will acquire her bike immediately. And as I said earlier, I don't want to use the bike. Luckily, it's not the most awkward gas can placement and can be easily avoided. Now as for the actual first difficulty, it's this Strider robot. It crawls up and down this purple wall and we have to defeat it in order to proceed. Sometimes it crawls just way too high for me to reach it with a roll and a regular jump, so I have to wait it for it to crawl back down while also avoiding projectiles it shoots at me. That's exactly what I did and took that thing down. After pushing a block to open the door and thrusting up from the geysers, I reached the first boss, Hunter Snake. There's nothing difficult about it, you just need to attack its armored segments while avoiding the flame it shoots at you. After removing all the armor plates, hit the head and we're good to go. We now proceed into the second half of the level, which really didn't cause any difficulty whatsoever. I took a few hits here and there, but I made it up for the lost health. All is simple until a giant boulder begins to roll after us. Despite both of us being masters of rolling, we couldn't reach a mutual agreement and so I had to let it go past me so I won't get hurt. But I'm dumb and somehow I ran into the boulder from behind, and then I was in front of it again. Anyway, after successfully escaping from the boulder, we have to face Hunter Snake once again. Now it makes rocks fall from the ceiling, some rocks even contain life battles. It also gets a new attack, it curls into a ball and bounces around the place. We still have to do the same thing, remove the armor plates from its segments, but we have to do it three times. It takes a little patience to finish this fight, but other than that, it's not very difficult. And just like that, we're done with our first level. The difficulty spikes a little bit in Relic Maze, but only because of enemy quantity. These bats can be annoying to deal with in large groups, but they also have very little health, so all I had to do was to roll and jump at the right moment. Other than the skip in the underground section, there's nothing much to note. This section requires you to complete two chambers and open the door to proceed. The underground section I just mentioned requires you to press a certain button, and the outdoor section requires you to defeat that weird golem, which you can do by dropping this block on its head. Thus we can enter a chamber with this yellow gem. But Shenmuzhan troops commit grand larceny and steal this gem, followed by wicked vandalism. Being the righteous girl she is, Carol wants to teach them a lesson and initiates a chase. Unfortunately, she's stopped by the first boss of the stage, the claw. Now, because I was impatient while I was fighting, I died. Twice. 
It is possible to beat this boss faster, but it's difficult to predict how the claw will move while shooting lasers. Most of the time it will be just out of reach, hence you should wait until it does 3 laser shots and after that it will charge at you, giving you a chance to strike. After defeating the claw, we can punish the Shenmujans by destroying the engine of their truck with the very gem they stole, but I decided that my spine would do the trick, and I almost died again because of that. Going down this elevator, we enter the second half of the level, situated in a mine, and once again there's really nothing much to show. I had a few close calls here and there, but that's about it. Eventually I reached this door. After entering the open passage, I had to activate two shrines. The one on the left has a descending spike floor, which will ascend once the shrine is active, and the one on the right guarded by a skeleton ostrich that does a good job at eliminating itself. We needed to activate the shrines in order for another passage to open so we could get to the Kingdom Stone Shrine. Oh, Spade already stole it. As much as I would like to kick his butt for that, we have to kick butt of another boss, Mantelith. In order to win this battle, you have to destroy its blade-like front legs before it puts its head down for you to hurt it. Rinse and repeat 4 more times. That's easier said than done, Mentalist's attacks aren't that simple to dodge, it can slice you with its blades or hurt you with rocks by drilling through the floor, and after a while it begins jumping around like a madman. I don't know whether its attacks are randomized or hard scripted, but I had trouble telegraphing its next move which in return led to unnecessary damage taken. I died once to Mentalith, but eventually I defeated it, which signifies the end of Relic Maze. Unfortunately, I had to replay the first two levels, because I didn't realize that OBS was capturing my cursor all along. And these three deaths I had in Relic Maze came from the rejected footage, and I didn't die once upon replaying it. Yet I decided to count the deaths to the total rundown. I sure am glad it didn't happen to me on any later level. Also, before moving on to the next level, I entered a bonus stage because I collected a yin yang token earlier on the level. It's not really important to this challenge, but I did get 2 extra lives out of it. That's still something. Moving on to Fortune Knight, this level once again poses no difficulty with its layout. In fact, the first half might be easier than Relic Maze because of reduced enemy quantity. The very few threats present are easily avoidable. There is an exception in the form of two UFOs, which you will encounter either way. The first UFO appears only about 40 seconds into the level, destroying the flow for you to proceed. Thanks aliens! You are meant to hang on a cable above the UFO, but you can take invincibility right before that part and avoid UFO's deadly laser. The second UFO encounter takes place much later into the level, and this time you have to run away from its laser, but as long as you move fast, this shouldn't be a problem. Really, the first half of Fortune Knight is very easy, maybe it's the easiest part of this challenge. Despite that, my curiosity got the best of me. I jumped on that roof and saw another gas can. I wanted to jump over it, but I accidentally touched it and Carol summoned her bike. Now as I said in the rules, if I get on the bike, I'll jump off right after. Look, this is just a human factor, I can't do everything perfectly. Anyway, after this bike fiasco and a UFO escape, I was going to face another boss. Uh, yeah, I don't know its official name, so let's just call it Samurai. Get it? Alright, what Samurai is doing is breaking the floor beneath us, but his third attack involves shooting some projectiles diagonally. Unlike all the previous bosses, we are on some sort of a time limit with this guy, as there are spikes below all the blocks of breakable floors. However, I defeated him too quickly for him to create any more difficulty. The ball on our right falls down and now we can- DAMN IT! And now we can enter the mall, but General Serpentine is on his way to hunt us down. However, it doesn't matter as of now, because we still have a whole new section to complete. So inside the mall we have to face off slightly more enemies and they become slightly more annoying to deal with, but we can just rush through them picking up shields if necessary. But sure, on hard difficulty, this strategy comes at the cost of your health. Luckily, there's one secret slash easter egg on this stage that can help us regain our health. You might have noticed keyboards around the place. If you press the keys quickly enough in a specific sequence, you will be rewarded with several life battles and an extra life, and the key sequence is hidden in a secret room behind a fake wall. 1, 3, 4, 5, 3, 1, 8. 
Now it's fairly easy to play this sequence as Lilac or Mila, but Carol kinda struggles with it. She isn't as vertically mobile as the other two, so she has to be more precise. You start with key 1, then jump on key 3, press keys 4 and 5 right after, then you jump back on 3, you pounce over key 1 to gain momentum, and lastly you run over key 1, jump, pounce and land on key 8, and lo and behold you get your health back. Interestingly enough, if you play the sequence on keyboards found on different screens, you can get your reward again, which is really neat. Now that we have full health and a few extra lives, we'll have to face off against another samurai. It's exactly the same fight, except this time it took just a little bit longer. After that we can leave them all, but uh oh, Serpentine is here with his Robo Panther and starts chasing us. Carol forces herself on a bike, but no worries, we can just wait. I can't dismount in this section. So this is the part for which I had to make an exception of using the bike, but not in the way you think. You see, I still don't quite understand the circumstances under which Carol's bike can hurt enemies on its own. As you can see from this clip, I just jumped at Robo Panther's hitbox and it dealt some damage to it. I don't want this to happen, hence why I tried avoiding using any bike move including double jump. However, I don't think it's doable without double jump. There are few attacks that are nearly impossible to avoid without it. So, because I won't be using the double jump to deal damage to Robo Panther, I decided to allow this move for this fight. But you might have got a question. How do we win? What do we have to do is to wait for Lilac to attack Serpentine, and believe it or not, it actually works! Lilac can complete the whole fight on her own. The only thing required from me is to survive for long enough. And this is why avoiding all of Serpentine's attacks is so important. Luckily, sometimes Torque's plane flies in and Mila drops life battles, so it's not as dire of a situation. Still, this battle is extremely tedious and it took me about 12 minutes to make it through. Mind you, if at any point Robo Panther was hurt by Kyle's bike, I would restart the fight. This is also the reason why title cards for the level say lives lost instead of just deaths. You lose a life upon restarting. Now that I've explained my strategy for this battle, let me just show you how obnoxious it is. The blue pill attack, uh, this projectiles are just shaped like pills and they're blue so it's a blue pill attack. The blue pill attack is fine and it's the easiest to dodge, you can just time your jump so right behind Robo Panther's head. So is Serpentine's barrage, you just need to be right below Serpentine to not get hit. But the missiles are just stupid. With their trail of flames you're almost guaranteed to either take damage yourself or damage Robo Panther. This attack is the reason I had to allow double jumps. The laser attack is annoying, but you can time your jumps and avoid it entirely. Lastly there is a rocket launcher attack, which is also very annoying. However, it can be avoided somewhat easily if you move across the screen as this attack is getting started. Also, if you haven't noticed yet, sometimes all of these attacks hurt Lilac delaying her strikes. Again, I don't know how much of the stuff present in this fight is randomized, if any, but this makes an extremely long fight even longer. But after what feels like forever, Lilac strikes one last time and Robo Panther is defeated. And let me tell you, that was just the taste of what is coming up later in this challenge. Just like all the previous stages, Sky Battalion wasn't much of an issue, however that was the first stage I was concerned about. In this stage we have to destroy cannons on three enemy ships, metal ship, fire ship and earth ship. You don't have to attack them in any particular order, so I started with the metal ship because it was the closest to the spawn point. While this level is easy, it features one of the most annoying enemies in the game, the laser turrets. Just look how swiftly it drains over half of my health, and I had a shield on me too. Yeah, there's one thing about this game I should have already mentioned. There's no invincibility frames, so any attack similar to this laser is guaranteed to drain at least half of your health on any difficulty. So if possible, we better destroy the stewards before they do anything. And this part right before the first miniboss is a good example. There are three laser turrets and they are all desynchronized, but each turret is also located higher than the previous one. This part forces us to deal with each turret individually before proceeding safely. And now we get to fight our first miniboss, the satellite. 
This guy is very difficult to hit as he floats too high for our jump to reach his hitbox. Fortunately, thanks to these slopes we can run on walls. Even better, if we can run on walls we can roll jump off the walls which is exactly what we need. Unfortunately, this only works when the satellite is close enough to either wall, otherwise he'll still be out of our reach. And usually when he approaches a wall, he does his spinning attack, and he killed me this way. On my second attempt, I tried staying next to the right wall, and whenever I had a chance, I would hit the miniboss, and in the end, it worked out. Now all we have to do is to destroy these two cannons. Thankfully, it's not a problem for Carol's spine. But before we return to our ship, I decided to get these life battles on the top deck. I took a leap of faith, and Torx saved me. What a hero! Next up is the fire ship, and as the name implies, it has fire traps. Luckily, this invincibility crystal right here made it easier to go through. This part is relatively short, and we are already fighting the next miniboss, a Schwigan Copter. And this one was a lot easier to damage than the satellite, because it does go down in between attacks. I did play impatiently, and as a result, I almost died again, but I took the copter down before it managed to take me down. I restored my health, grabbed an extra life, destroyed the cannons and returned to the main ship. Before we continue, you might be wondering, why am I not taking life battles from this flower at the start? I just want to keep it for the end of the level. And last but not least is Earth Ship, where we are at risk of getting crushed by either um, crushers and these weird purple crystals. Before getting to the mini boss, I grabbed this metal shield, which gives protection from spikes and immunity to electricity. And here's the final mini boss of Sky Battalion, the Grappler. And this guy was the subject of my concerns. Normally, he drops this yellow crystal thingy from his back and it acts as a platform, which later flies up and returns to Grappler's back. Originally, I thought the platform was too narrow to perform a roll, but to my surprise, you actually can roll on that platform despite it being that narrow. After that discovery, this mini boss became a complete joke. Since I'm wearing a metal shield, these yellow orbs can't hurt me and the crystal spikes summoned from platform dropping are easily avoided with a simple jump. You can still miss a hit and wait for another attack cycle, but it's not that big of a deal. And with Grappler down and the last two cannons destroyed, we can go back to our ship and face off against the final boss of this level. This is the first Prince Dale encounter, and here he pilots this green peacock robot. Overall, this battle shouldn't be that difficult, but there were two problems. First, I lost my metal shield by jumping on these crystal spikes at the end of the grappler fight. With a metal shield I could have avoided some of Dale's attacks entirely. And second, I wasn't playing well. I wasn't timing my jumps good enough when he was charging at me. Good thing I saved this life flower or else I would already be dead. Overall, as long as you're not me, none of Dale's attacks should pose any threat. The electric orb is slow, the electric charges have enough space in between, and the hurricane can't even hurt you. As to how you defeat this boss, the peacock has a hitbox on each of its tail feathers. Once all of them are destroyed, he starts charging at you, and after 4 charges the cycle repeats. You need to survive 5 cycles in total, and the boss is down. Now, if you thought this challenge was gonna be easy till the end of the game... <laughs> The tables are about to turn. Ok, you saw the title card. This stage alone took me almost 3 times the lives I've lost on the first 4 levels combined, and I've spent almost twice as much time on this level as I did on Fortune Knight. And that includes the Robo Panther boss fight. The difficulty ramps up significantly in Jade Creek, but let's talk about all the problems one at a time. The stage starts with Carol riding a bike, which I will ditch immediately, don't worry. However, this is what the first problem is. This level is meant to be played fast and without her bike, Carol loses a lot of speed. Why do you have to play this stage fast, you may ask? Enemies. There's too many of them and most of them require not only fast movement but fast reaction as well. From this meteorite robot shot out of the police unit to these giant frogs and underwater torpedoes, they all show you that child games are over. Somehow I made it through the first screen without dying, only to die to the purple grew of this weird blue peak with purple hair? Anyway, after avoiding this robot and its attack, as well as swimming through this water section, I reached the first bubble part and I was lucky enough to land very close to this invincibility crystal. After that... I touched another gas can. Seriously, why there's so many of them? That aside, this next part clearly shows how weak Carol is without a bike. 
Normally you would jump to this dandelion and grab a seed that acts like a parachute in order to reach the next dandelion. However, I couldn't even reach the first dandelion. My jump was lined up with this crystal shard, so I'm pretty sure I timed it correctly. Yeah, this part wasn't created with Bikeless Carol in mind, hence we have to take this jump pad in order to make it to the other side, and I did the same for the section above. After that, there was no special part to mention, all I had to do was some careful maneuvering. When I reached this part after this small loop, I grabbed the wood shield which attracts life battles in a small area around, and after another short chase sequence we have to fight Mira Lee. And oh man, this woman is nuts. She's jumping so high, her ice spikes and lassoes deal a lot of damage, and how come she gets new shields out of thin air, and why can't she do this in FP2? All jokes aside, once again I was playing impatiently, which made me freeze to death again and again and again and again, and guess what, again! Ok, I think you got my point. This fight was super annoying, but after multiple attempts, I finally defeated Nira and could move on. This section with the submarine may seem more intense, but it really isn't that bad. At least the enemy density isn't as crazy, and there's also plenty of shields. After the submarine, Nier tries to strike again, but she gets frozen by her teammate. I guess somebody's getting fired tonight. Anyway, the following section is even easier, there are barely any enemies, but wait till we get to the boss. Torque is getting abducted and we rush to save him, but Serpentine corners us and one of the most obnoxious boss battles for this challenge begins. What's the problem? In the first phase you can't telegraph Serpentine's attacks, you won't know if he's about to use a flamethrower or do a bullet barrage until it's too late. If you happen to be right above him during the barrage, you might just give up right away. This attack takes the entirety of your health bar. I'm sorry, but this is just absurd. You are pretty much at the mercy of RNG in this phase. Oh, but that's not all. If you're lucky enough to defeat Serpentine, the <laughs> You are pretty much at the mercy of RNG in this phase. Oh, but that's not all. If you're lucky enough to defeat Serpentine, he then gets into a helicopter. The good thing is that unlike the previous one, this phase follows a strict attack pattern. But that's the only good thing. First, he summons two Shade Troopers. They are difficult to deal with on their own, thanks to their high health and desynchronized attacks, but in this fight they also drop a gas cannon defeat. Great! Not only do I have to deal with Serpentine and his henchmen, but the battlefield may turn into a minefield if I'm not careful. Touching a gas can is a death sentence in this fight. You won't have enough time to dismount, at least not without losing half of your health bar. Once the Shade Troopers are down, Serpentine lowers his copter slightly and starts shooting directed shots from both sides of his aircraft. This is the only moment in the fight when we can hurt him, and even then, because he's floating, his altitude changes constantly. At one moment he's in our reach, and the next moment he's just too high. After that, he launches missiles, and the only way to guarantee it won't hit you is to jump up the wall on the very right. You should know by now that we can't lose too much health. And then the cycle repeats, but now Mila joins the battle and throws in a life flower. This will make it easier to deal with the Shade Troopers, but that's about it. She can't hurt Serpentine in any way, nor can she spawn even more life flowers. Add up the facts that this boss has a lot of health, and that each attempt may take over 2 minutes and you've got a recipe for disaster. I can't stress enough how difficult this battle is, but guess what happens next? At some point, one Shade Trooper randomly decided to go left, not minding me at all, and he went completely off-screen. Serpentine doesn't fly lower because not all troopers are defeated. I have only one life left so I can restart, which means that I'm practically softlocked and I have no other option than to restart the whole level. That's already one hell of an insult to injury, but this attempt took me over 5 minutes. So I felt completely defeated after that fiasco. But I restarted the stage anyway, and then I died to a meteorite robot only to find out I had to start from the very beginning of the level. And then I forgot to get off the bike. So that was another reset. Look, I'm exhausted and defeated, no wonder I'm making so many mistakes now. After another reset, I made it to Nira and died. But then I defeated her on my next try and WHOA! Evely space program initiated! Then I again made it to Serpentine, and then I died again, and again, and AGAIN! I... Uh, I'm sorry. But between my attempts, something even more obnoxious happened. 
Watch carefully. Yep, Serpentine just switched his attack during an attack animation, as if this battle wasn't obnoxious enough. Also, at this point, I might have realized that Mila can actually screw you up by killing the troopers in the wrong spot, leaving a gas can in the open, and not next to the wall where I want them to be. But despite everything, after what felt like an eternity, the window on Serpentine's copter cracked open and Lila came in clutch to take him down. At last, this battle is over and I can bri- Oh no... Oh no... If you thought we're now past the most difficult part, allow me to introduce you to Trap Hideout, which right away starts with narrow spaces filled with lasers. I know I already emphasized that, but holy stones, look at how much health I've lost from this one laser! Anyway, after this section with lasers, we get to a new obstacle. There are breakable blocks on the platform, but the portion on which we can stand seems to be too small to perform a roll, but no. It seems like performing a roll is doable as long as you can stand. Then there was this laser bat mini boss, which wasn't difficult even with a bit of health loss on my end. Now we're entering the hideout itself. It was quite dangerous to navigate given my low health and many hazards with janky hitboxes. However, as long as I've taken my time, I could have easily avoided most of the hazards, including these awkwardly placed gas cans. But eventually I got electrocuted because I began rushing again which led to my demise. That's alright, I learned from my mistakes. After the barrel fiasco, I climbed up the section to face another mini-boss. This time it was this weird crystal maze. At first I thought I can't reach its hitbox unless it's crushing down side to side. But I completely forgot you can roll on walls. This brain fart cost me my full health. Shocking, I know. Now we're entering a new section with red scarves ninjas riding bikes. But right now they're not of my concern. Ok, maybe a little bit. That just shows how impatient I really am, because taking care of enemies one by one turned out to be a more reliable approach. If there's anything to learn from this challenge, is to take your time and not rush like I usually do. Also, this section was probably meant to be played with Carol on bike, judging by gas cans every 3 meters. But despite me trying to play safe, I fell into this bomb trap and lost half of my health. Again. But this next part was neat. There are dozens of springs and hundreds of crystal shards with no threat whatsoever. That didn't really help as I got killed right after, so I had to do the section again. At least I got an extra life. But prepare yourselves as we are about to enter the arena. Remember how earlier I said ninjas aren't that big of a threat? Well, I take it back. Now we have to fight 99 of them in order to finish the stage. This is where the enemy density reaches its peak. There's just way too much going on on the screen to not get hit. To make matters even worse, there are gas cans on both ends of the arena. And if in the copter serpentine fight there was room for error, here touching a gas can means personally signing your death certificate. This brings the question, what on Avalis are we supposed to do? This question bothered me for the first dozen attempts or so. I was just hoping I could dodge all the ninja stars they threw at me. Obviously, it didn't work at all. I even got a game over screen for the first time in this challenge. And I guess it's a good time to say that lives in this game... Uh, they don't matter at all. Because even if you get a game over, you'll be respawned at the last checkpoint. It's certainly a good thing for this challenge, but it doesn't solve our problem with the ninjas. After several game overs, I realized that I need a better strategy than just praying to RNGs. You might have noticed that the arena's floor is covered with jump pads, but only two of them are working. That's because they send you to the other side of the arena when used. I thought maybe I can utilize them to my advantage. And while it did help me survive for a little longer in the next few attempts, the ninjas would eventually catch up to me. I turned back to mindlessly rolling around when I found a movement pattern that works most of the time. Originally I thought it's best to cover the whole arena with my movement so the ninjas won't strike in large groups, but I've never considered the opposite scenario of narrowing the space of my movement. 
Now what I try to do is to roll jump at one place by moving along an ellipse or sometimes a heart shape and change my position every so often when there were too many projectiles spawned near me, whether manually or through use of jump pads. This strategy worked perfectly the first time I executed it. Even better, when there are less than 20 ninjas left, the remaining will drop life battles. But we're not even close to being done. That's right, we have to fight Spade. If you thought Serpentine was bad, Spade is him but on steroids. At least Serpentine's attacks are easily avoidable with good reaction. Spade is an absolute menace in comparison. He only has two attacks, but man does he make full use of them. His card spread throw covers the whole arena and the cards themselves are moving really fast. And as for the card blast, he uses that attack only when he's close enough to the player. The cherry on top has to be him constantly moving, never opening himself for a hit. You can fend off all the ninjas perfectly and keep your health at full up to the spade fight, but he can still obliterate you. The only way I could avoid his cards is by keeping my distance, but then I couldn't deal any damage to him. But the closer he is to you, the more likely it is for you to die. The only hit you can do somewhat consistently is right after he drops down on the arena. So this fight comes down to good RNG on top of playing well, and ninjas before that were still giving me lots of trouble. While my strategy works, there's still a chance you will get overwhelmed by sheer amount of enemies. But after many deaths, this was my best attempt. Phew, these were the most intense 90 seconds of my life. This stage took me twice as many lives as the last one. The last fighting section alone took me more than 30 attempts. I'm so glad it's finally over and I don't have to do this fight ever again. The last two stages were absolutely brutal, but we are only halfway through the game and the difficulty won't decrease much from this point. I began thermal base by blowing myself up on a bomb. That's because I have no health left and didn't bother to exit to the main menu, and I know you want my death count to be higher, so here you are. Once again, because I lack such an important human quality as patience, I lost my health to various hazards and eventually died to this cricket enemy's attack. I made it through the second time, and after that I reached the part with moving platforms, and you can use the ones on the ceiling to try to clip yourself out of bounds. This strategy is actually used in speedruns, but no matter how many times I tried, I couldn't get myself clipped through the ceiling. The best I've ever gotten was clipping through the platform's geometry, but that's about it. The small mini-boss fight after that was definitely doable while only rolling, so I gave up on trying to clip out of bounds. Ok, I tried a few times on my way back, but to no avail. Not like I would skip a large portion of the level anyway. However, on the next screen we ran into a problem. Eventually you'll fall into a death trap with this shade trooper pushing you into lava. Normally, if you hit him you will push him back and blow him up with the explosives on the other side of the room. But since we are not allowed to use any attack move other than rolling, we can only do so much. So is this the end? After so much effort put into the last few levels we are getting stopped by the game design not being in our favor? Not just yet. It's time to put my limited knowledge of the game's bugs to use. For this we have to backtrack a few rooms and enter this chamber with lots of crates. There's a glitch I'd like to refer to as crate clipping and it's another trick used in speedruns. 
If you boink your head on a crate from below, it will bounce up and fall back down. However, if you jump constantly, the crate will eventually get stuck in another crate and reject gravity. And it's somehow used to clip out of bounds. I guess what happens is that the crates being clipped into one another push your characters upwards while trying to get themselves unclipped. I was pretty sure I was doing something wrong and I was about to go and watch on YouTube how the glitch is done, but just when I was about to do so, I suddenly clipped through the ceiling, which is exactly what I wanted. From here we just have to hold right and go to the next screen. I was low on health, so in the next section I was shot by the troopers, but that's not important. You see, I wanted to take this metal shield with me, because it will be very useful during the upcoming boss fight. But my hopes were shattered as I lost it to the cricket right before the boss fight. Even worse, there's no way for me to backtrack now, so the battle against Syntex in spider mode becomes a lot harder. As you can see, there are spikes on the sides of the room, and the metal shield would have granted me spike immunity. How does it help exactly? There's a glitch that freezes Syntex in place if you constantly pause in the game while she throws or collects lava. I couldn't get this glitch working either and died to the flow of hot lava shortly after. Not like the glitch would have helped me without the metal shield anyway. On my next attempt I tried playing more carefully, timing my jumps and ducks so I could avoid lava. That worked well, but then there was Syntax's second phase and PLEASE CAN WE STOP WITH THE BOSSES THAT DON'T OPEN UP FOR A HIT! That's another reason I wanted to keep the metal shield. With it, this phase becomes a joke. Without it, it's a very painful experience. You have to make a perfect roll jump to the side of the boss while not getting hit by the spikes. If you take damage, you're forced out of the rolling state. I managed to defeat Syntex on the verge of dying, but right after that we have to escape from lava, and what a better way to ruin this attempt than putting a freaking gas can right where I would land. Thanks game, thank you very much! Anyway, I did the boss fight again, avoided both the gas can and lava and moved on to the next half of the level. There's nothing to say about the second half of the level. We just play it normally, but because Carol can wall jump, we can skip some platforming sections and approach key cards from the other side. Then we do some swimming, avoid crushers and take an elevator, or more like wall jump up the elevator shaft, to the end boss of thermal base, Syntax Squid Mode. This battle wasn't difficult per se, it's just I was drained mentally after what I had to deal with in Trap Hideout. I was making a lot of mistakes that led to health loss and a single death. The only problem in this fight are the ladders. They won't let you perform a roll for obvious reasons and this can be annoying. The same can be said about Syntax's movement. Most of the time her hitbox will be out of your reach, but again, as long as you take your time this shouldn't be an issue. In between her regular attacks you can just cling on this ladder and you'll avoid getting hit by these spike balls. With the boss done, thermal base comes to a close, and now we're onto another difficult level. Here we are at Battle Glacier, and it's also among the most difficult levels for this challenge. However, we start with a shoot em up section. Now, if you recall the rules, I said we won't count the sections with a different moveset, and yeah, it's that exact instance. We are operating a tank with no way of rolling, but we have to complete this section in order to beat the game. On the other hand, this section doesn't count to total playtime and death count. Furthermore, you can't access it if you were to play Battle Glacier through the Time Attack menu. I hope that's a good enough reason to not count this section towards the challenge. If you think otherwise, that means the challenge is impossible, but I'll keep going with the rules I have. With that said, I can just sit back and mash the attack buttons repeatedly to obliterate every enemy that comes my way until we face a boss, another version of Syntax and this time it's Cancer Mode. I thought I could defeat her without ever having to jump, but I was proved wrong when she destroyed me with her lasers. Yeah, Cancer Mode indeed. And yes, I'm counting this fail to total death count despite this section not doing so. Look, my dumb challenge, my dumb rules. After all, you want me to include every death I have, don't you? I redid the battle, this time I did if I get to jump and destroy that drone. Now the stage begins properly, and right away the game throws dozens and dozens of enemies at us. But somehow I managed to avoid nearly all of them with only losing a few shields. After that, belly slide, whee! My joy was cut shortly as I lost all my health to a single missile explosion. And then restored it again thanks to this wood shield, and lost it again because of rolling into these bombs. Okay, this level looks very intimidating, but somehow I didn't die yet. For the most part I was losing health and restoring it shortly after. 
Then there were these rocket drills that we have to launch into explosive boxes in order to proceed. It's not difficult, you just have to time your all jumps and you have to face the direction you want to launch the drill. Despite many close calls in this half of the level, I managed to make it to the next boss without much trouble. And now we're facing Absolution. The boss that many people find extremely difficult and I don't really get why. All you have to do is to hit its eye and move as it jumps. And because we're playing as Carol, we can just jump up a wall to avoid it charging at us if springs seem too risky. This boss is it. <laughs> I'm not giving up my point, this boss isn't hard, I'm just tired, moving on. Next we have a part I don't really like playing casually, let alone in a challenge. This half of the stage is a giant set of puzzles of sorts. For example, this passage is blocked, and so we have to go to a different area and defeat this guy. And he goes ballistic with his guns, so much so I couldn't handle the sheer rain of bullets. <sighs> Honestly, at this point, I was raging really hard at the smallest mistakes. I shouldn't have tried to beat the rest of the game on the same day as Trap Hideout. That level is gonna haunt me till the end of this challenge. All I had to do to not die to this enemy again and again was to, say it with me, take my time. And third time's the charm, he's defeated. The passage from before is now open and we can move on. After another rocket drill part, we enter a section with a new gimmick, switches that enable and disable red and green blocks. It's not a problem, it's here just to extend our playtime. This section, however, is annoying, because these robots can blast you back at the switch causing you to fall down, and apparently they also like to ambush. Yeah, it's better to get rid of these guys so it won't happen again. Still, this level wasn't very nice to me, as on my next attempt I died to the Strider from Dragon Valley. <sighs> this level takes forever! In fact, this is the longest level in the game, with a speedrun achievement requirement being to complete it under 12 minutes. Just to put it into perspective, the average between the rest of the levels is about 8 minutes. Luckily, we're finally at the boss. It's Prince Dale again and this time he controls this abomination. The strategy for this fight is simple, just wait when he lowers the beast's head down so we can remove his shield and hit him afterwards. The execution, however, isn't as simple. The battle begins with Dale throwing three sets of electrified cards, which are following you around. Then he does the lightning strikes, then he throws electrified cards again, and only then he goes down, while also spawning these crab enemies, which sometimes drop health on death, and shooting orbs of dark energy from the beast's mouth, before repeating the attack side. Cycle. The electrified cards are the worst attack. No matter how much I tried, I would always get hit by at least one of them, but it's more than enough to take me down a few times. Oh yeah, there's also a gas can on the right, but the arena is big enough, so it's the least of my concern. It just wasn't a fun battle. Each attempt would take 2 or 3 minutes and losing progress to a random card was just devastating. It's nowhere nearly as bad as Spade, but it definitely got on my nerves. Now that we've defeated Dale once more, it's time to tackle the last four stages of the game. We are on the home stretch now. All of the final Dreadnought levels are relatively short, but they still offer a lot of challenges. And by challenges I mean waiting for these lasers to shoot. Then we are stalled by another inconveniently placed gas can, just as Lord Brevan sends a bajillion troopers to hunt us down. But as we usually do, we just ignore them and barely survive the onslaught. Oh yeah, this part with the airlocks is so much fun! Bro, what was that shot? It's like the most no-scope 360 thing I've ever seen in this game. If you don't get it, this enemy right here turn around and bullseye at me while being off-screen. That's just insane. Oh, and then I died to a purple orb. And would you look at this great checkpoint placement where I got hit by a laser before I was even given control. Honestly, this part is a complete Delta Sierra, both for this challenge and for a casual playthrough. I almost made it through this section when I decided to see what's up this platform and curiosity almost killed the cat. Turns out there was just another bridge across the gap. It doesn't matter as I fully restored my health somehow and reached the boss and it's yet another Syntax encounter, are you kidding me? It also might be the most annoying version of Syntax we had displeasure to fight in this challenge. First of all, just like many bosses we've faced in this playthrough, this one doesn't give much room for a hit without getting hurt. Plus there's a laser wall chasing us so we have to move constantly. And let me tell you, it's very easy to take unnecessary hits in this fight. Syntax also has many transformations 
munitions at her disposal, and she gets more as the fight progresses. She can turn into a tank and move on the ceiling and on the floor, and shoot the opposite surface as she moves. She can turn into a locomotive and shoot plasma that, you know. She can turn into a pogo stick, which is probably the easiest to avoid. And lastly, she can turn into a soul blade that moves along a rectangle, covering the whole screen. This one is the most problematic, as when she moves from bottom left corner to bottom right, she forces you to jump. Usually it's not a problem. Mila can flutter and Lilac has a double jump. Carol also has access to double jump, but only when she's riding a bike. Without it, Carol's single jump is just barely high enough to avoid getting hit by the soul blade. Yeah, this fight wasn't really designed for bikeless Carol. There's even a gas can right before the boss fight to make this fight easier. Aside from that, her tank form was annoying as well, because I still wanted to make a few free hits to Syntax, but it would always end up in me getting hurt. Heck, even when I wasn't going to hit her, I would still get hurt. Oh, right. As the last resort, Syntax will turn into... whatever this thing is, and shoot giant purple spheres. They would have definitely killed me. To this day, I have no idea how to avoid this attack properly. But I said screw it and just take the last few hits. I took the risk and was rewarded with the boss's defeat. Let's see what the rest of Final Dreadnought has in store for us. Immediately after starting Final Dreadnought 2, I knew I had to play carefully. Not only because I have very little health left, but I remember this stage to have a lot of awkward enemy and hazard placements. And then I jumped into the goo left by this slime. The irony. But my point is clear. For example, you won't get around this enemy without getting hit. You better wait out its attack and move on. <coughs> well, this flower certainly doesn't smell nice. Attempt number 2, I've eliminated the flower as soon as I entered the room and took these two keycards with me. Yeah, this stage is also puzzle oriented like the second half of Battle Glacier, but it's not as tedious, except for this part. I don't like it. You have to retrieve a keycard from the squid robot and bring it to the door with the next teleporter. But this room is very difficult. They are shade troopers who have a lot of health, they are stinky flowers that cover a big portion of the screen with their attack, and there's also the squid itself. There's no way I'm getting through it with that little health. I did retrieve the keycard on my next attempt, but as you can see I almost died again. Going through this section was very scary. One hit and I'm dead. I don't want to redo this section with the squid. <coughs> Never mind. This time, however, the luck was finally in my favor. The squid floated all the way to the right and I got the key card in no time. Not only that, but I also didn't get hit, meaning I had full health and a shield on top of it. So I wasn't worried about getting hit a few times before proceeding into the next section. And as it usually happens at this point, as soon as I entered the new area, I lost all my health to enemies that got in my way and died shortly after. I tried again and managed to get to the next screen. And this is the part where Brevan brags about his troops before depleting oxygen. Luckily, we're given just enough time to make our way to this vent where Mila spawns a water shield that lets us breathe freely. But we're about to lose our shield in this set of rooms. These lasers are desynchronized, making it very easy to get hit by by one of them while trying to dodge the other. And sure enough, I lost it. Thankfully, Melee is a generous soul and gives us another water shield from the same vent, and another one at the next vent. And now we're at the last section before the boss. This is an elevator shaft where we have to power, well, the elevator with these buttons while also avoiding the mines. I lost my water shield again, so I tried to rush this section to the top where oxygen is no longer depleted, but I died from a mine explosion. Uh, okay, I guess I don't need this shield. But yeah, I already knew I was going to lose another life because I had too little time to reach the top. By the way, this is the first time in this game that I ever died of suffocation. And then this happened.
for whatever reason the music glitched out and I had Final Dreadnoughts theme on the game over screen and game over theme on the level itself. The game just tells me that I lost no matter what, but I'm not going to give up just yet, regardless of what the game thinks of me. Honestly, game over music fits this section too well. Anyway, I reached the final elevator, but I decided to skip it by wall jumping. I got hit twice, but I managed to do it. And now... Oh, stones, we have to fight Serpentine again. But believe it or not, this is actually the easiest Serpentine encounter. Why? The walls. For whatever reason, this arena has walls on both sides, and Carol's ability to wall jump trivializes this boss fight. Whenever Mutant Serpentine attacks, we can just slide down the wall, avoid everything he throws, then climb back up and hit him a few times. Not gonna lie, wall jumping is OP and I can't imagine what I would do without it. Yeah, I died once to this boss, but it's nothing in comparison to, what, like 10 times during the copter fight? While Carol's wall jumps definitely simplify this battle, it still requires reaction and some skill in order to complete it, especially during the second phase when Serpentine attacks faster. Still, this this fight doesn't even come close to all the savages we've fought before. 10 levels done, just 2 more to go. Let's do it! I may sound like a broken record at this point, but Final Dreadnought 3 starts with me losing a life to get my health back. This stage is faster paced than the previous one. It even has boosters that accelerate you slightly. Either way, I grabbed the first key card and teleported back right behind a booster. But for some reason I thought it was the wrong way and I went the same way that I used to get the key card. I told you that trap hideout still haunts me. Next time I went the right way, and as soon as I opened the door I got rid of this laser turret before it caused any inconvenience. Brevin is being sarcastic before bringing out the big guns. Literally. But honestly, they are barely a threat as long as you can hide from them and wait until they recharge. To be fair, it's the enemy density that becomes a difficulty on this stage. Ah! Whoops. Okay, I'm rewatching this moment and I don't get whether this death was accidental or did I do this on purpose. But considering how much easier I swoop beside these enemies, I guess it's the latter. In the next corridor, the enemy density becomes so absurd it's physically impossible to take down all of them and it's more worth it to just run for your life. And I still got overwhelmed. The next attempt went a lot smoother though. Then I took the wrong path again and reached the door before obtaining the key card. Seriously, what's wrong with me? I can't use the trap hideout trauma as an excuse for any longer. Anyway, I made it to the final room and was about to shut down this stupid dreadnought for good, but Brevin breaks in and holds Mila hostage. With no other choice, Carol throws the key card at the warlord's feet who crushes it immediately after. Brevin releases Mila, but before I knew it, she transforms into an abominable monstrosity and now she's after my blood. I'm tired of repeating myself, but this battle once again gives very little room for a hit. But what makes it a lot more annoying are the attacks. These green sound waves are so inconsistent I have steer clue how to ensure I won't get hit by them. It feels like the phantom cubes also fly out and explode wherever the heck they want, and Mila doesn't even really give you a break between her attacks. She can start launching the cubes before the sound waves are even gone. For all these inconsistencies, this battle becomes unnecessarily harder. So much so I lost 4 times. You know, it's just one of the fights where I couldn't think of any strategy. I was just trying to avoid as much damage as I could while trying to attack when I felt like it was the best opportunity. And while this is not a single time occurrence in this challenge, I managed to defeat her with no health to spare. I'm so sorry I had to do this, Mila. But I promise, Brevin will pay for that. Right. Now. This is it folks, Final Dreadnought 4, the last level of the game. This is where the fate of this challenge lies. Unlike the rest of the levels I started with no health, I decided to move on with what I have and almost die to this crab thanks to an awkwardly placed ladder. On the bright side, each crab enemy I've encountered dropped a life battle, so it's worth stopping for a moment to restore my health. And in no time I... <laughs> 
I should stop counting my chickens too early. Now that I got a shield, I decided that I don't need any more health and I could rush the rest of the stage. I tried to do another speedrun strat. This one involves clipping yourself into the wall on the right with the help of reappearing blocks. But I wasn't successful with that and I decided to continue normally. I played this stage a lot of times in the past, so you could say I wasn't particularly worried about my current health. Now we've reached the section with the SUPER LASER PISS! <clears throat> now we reach the section with a giant laser constantly shooting in the center of this room. Not getting out of the laser's way in time is a death sentence, regardless of how much health you have, so we better avoid it. As well as these stupid dumb laser turrets. Oh, and these guns that appear on the walls and shoot you, we should avoid them as well. But would you look at this wombo combo? How was I supposed to see that coming? It's official, I had enough of these turrets. Fortunately, the rest of the <laughs> laser tower ascent didn't have any more unpleasant surprises. It was a smooth sailing right to the final boss, Lord Brevan. This fight is divided into three phases. The first one is Absolution that we fought before, except with some different attacks. And unlike the previous incarnation, I defeated this one on my first try. I lost all of my health, but it doesn't matter. I've been fully restored before moving on to the second phase, the Power Armor. And believe it or not, I took it down on my first try as well. However, this phase was certainly a lot scarier with Brevin's sudden movements, especially when he curls into a ball and starts bouncing around the room. But it didn't give me much trouble. I think I managed to fool the AI and make it charge at me while I was next to a wall, which gave me a lot of time to strike back, and with that I managed to save even more health than the last phase. And now comes the third and the last phase. And what could be a more appropriate way to end the challenge than with yet another boss who never opens up for a free hit and requires a dozen attempts before going down. In this fight, Brevin's knife is the scariest attack, as it takes away a record 6 battles from your health. And it's very difficult to dodge this attack, but with a precise jump it's more than possible. Other than that, Brevin has landmines and a gun. Sometimes he'd be happy to grab and throw you to the other side of the room. And after a while, he flies up and leaves some green waves behind. Okay, frankly, nothing aside from Brevin's knife can hurt you in this fight, if you know what you're doing, that is. But it's pretty easy to lose track of his attacks and die moments later. Eventually, the best strategy for this fight I could think of was to always let him grab and throw me and then run to the opposite side. Run on the walls or on the ceiling as long as I'm sure he won't use a dagger. And damage him only when he comes back from his flying attack, as he'll most likely start with the throw. Furthermore, it's a lot easier to dodge the knife while wall jumping. Also, the sound cues are crucial. When I hear this sound, that means Brevon wants to throw me. And this one indicates that he wants to grind up some cat meat. And when I hear this sound, that means I can let go of the wall as he begins flying. But this fight wouldn't be complete if I didn't lose all my health before the end of it. But despite all the troubles and danger of this battle, Lord Brevin was finally defeated, which confirms that it is possible to beat Freedom Planet while only rolling. I am in disbelief this is actually doable, and on the hardest difficulty too. But don't go yet, there's still one more thing to try out with this challenge in mind, Shenmue Academy. That's right guys, we're doing the 18 Shengmu Academy courses. They are all super short, so I won't spend too much time on them. Course 1 is easy, just hold right, roll, jump a few times and you'll win. Course 2 requires a bit more input, but it's still easy, and so is Course 3. Course 4 features some rotating spike balls and spikes on the top floor, but as long as we're cautious, we'll be fine. Same with the Course 5 and its rotating spiny columns. Course 6 is very simple. Course 7 requires a tricky jump to reach this target and then this target over the spikes, but it's doable. So are Courses 8 and 9. Course 10, however, is where a streak of possible courses ends. We can avoid these spike balls, but these two targets are out of our reach. And no, springs force you out of the rolling state. Also, it's plus 2 deaths to the total death count. Unfortunately, course 11 is not doable either. You can get all but two targets. I think the one under the starting platform could be reached with some precise movement, but it wouldn't matter as the target above us is just a few pixels too high. But luckily, courses 12 and 13 are possible. 
Curse 14 looks like another no-go because of this target on the ceiling, but to my surprise, Carol can roll while walking on the ceiling as well, making this another doable curse. Curse 15's targets are located in very tight spaces, especially this one between the letters O and R, but it is indeed possible to roll into that gap, making it another successful curse. Curse 16 is not possible, and it's the worst of our performance. There are a lot of targets found in between the ladders with nothing but spikes underneath. We can get two targets on top of the ladders, then this one because it's actually close enough to a solid platform. We can also take a blind jump and get this target as well, but not the rest. You can probably reach another one right here, but you won't survive after that. Lastly, courses 17 and 18 are both doable. And that wraps up not only Shenmue Academy, but the challenge as a whole. We did it! All 12 stages from the main campaign are possible while only rolling, and so are 15 out of 18 courses of Shenmue Academy. The whole playthrough minus Shenmue Academy took me about 211 minutes, or about 3 hours and a half. Throughout my journey I lost a total of 109 lives, or 113 if we include Shenmue Academy, and I got a game over screen 21 times. Not like it matters anyway, but according to the end screen I've collected 2764 crystal shards throughout the game. The shortest stage was Dragon Valley, taking only 6 minutes to complete. It was also the least deadly stage with no lives lost whatsoever. On the other side of the spectrum, the stage that took me the longest time to beat was Jade Creek, which took me a whole 43 minutes to complete. The deadliest stage was, of course, Trap Hideout, with 36 lives lost. If I were to rank the bosses from the easiest to hardest, Hunter Snake of Dragon Valley would be the easiest, while the cake of the most difficult would be shared between Helicopter Serpentine of Jade Creek and Spade of Trap Hideout. Phew, and that's about it, ladies and gentlemen. Carol sure feels dizzy after all this rolling. Let her rest, she deserved it. If there's a lesson to learn from this video, it's to be patient and take as much time as you need to reach your goal. It seems that sometimes the best strategy is waiting and observing, to come up with a better strategy, that is. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it, and if you did, leave a like and subscribe to this channel. If you want me to do the same challenge for Freedom Planet 2, or maybe try something different, you can let me know in the comments down below. It's been Lunatic Ludwig, until next time.